Hereby I open this academic ceremony in which Estera Wiesorek will defend the academic thesis, organizational and financial aspects affecting care transition in long-term care systems, analysis of selected European countries. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Yes, thank you. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear Discipline Board at the Jagiellonia University, dear colleagues, friends and family members, and all people watching this defense online. It is my great privilege to present to you my project that I've been working on for the past four years, along with its impacts and findings. And the project focused on organizational and financial aspects affecting care transitions in long-term care systems. The world population is aging, and it is estimated that by 2050, approximately more than one in four individuals will be aged 65 years and older. At, at present, the highest share of older adults aged 65 years and older can be found in Northern America and Europe. And it is estimated by, that by 2050, also these countries will be leading in terms of the share of older adults aged 65 years and older. And older adults, they are more likely to suffer from chronic diseases, multimorbidity, polypharmacy, and have complex care needs. And as a result, they might be more likely to be high users of health and social care services, might require care from more than one provider at the same time, and also they are more likely to experience care transitions. And one of the most vulnerable times in a person's life is when they are sick and in need of care, but also when they transition between the different providers and settings. And transitions of care can be defined as the patient transfer between different locations or different levels of care within the same location. So, up, for example, the patient transfer from hospital to home or the patient transfer from nursing home to hospital. And annually, approximately 20% of older adults experience care transitions. And poor care transitions are not only happening in countries with emerging economies. They are also happening in countries with well-established health and long-term care systems. And we know that poor care transitions might result in many negative outco outcomes for the patients, informal caregivers, but also for the health and long-term care systems. And for instance, suboptimal care transitions might lead, among others, to increase in mortality, morbidity, adverse events, hospitalizations, but also increase in healthcare costs. And majority of suboptimal care transitions can be prevented. And one might ask, what does it mean to optimize care transition? So first, it is about avoiding unnecessary care transitions, for example, <coughs> hospitalizations of the patients, or movement of patients to institutional settings when in fact they could be taken care of at home. But it is also about improving care for transitions that are needed. So if the transition has to take place, it should be of high quality, do no harm to the patient, and leave the patient and informal caregivers satisfied. And with this project, we try to identify which organizational and financial aspects affect care transitions in long-term care systems. Moreover, we also try to inform the improvement of care transitions by identifying the good practices as well as challenges that need to be addressed. And also, we try to develop an assessment tool for assessing the performance of long-term care systems in relation to care transitions. And in order to address these aims, first, we performed systematic literature review that pointed out to various organizational and financial aspects affecting care transitions. Later on, we, try, we did in-depth semi-structured interviews with key country informants in order to obtain the insights into organizational and financial challenges affecting care transitions in long-term care systems in their countries. 
And specifically, we looked at Germany, the Netherlands, and Poland. Later, we analyzed different policies for supporting informal caregivers in the European Union and outlined the arguments for and against integrating programs that encourage informal care. At last, we developed an assessment tool. And systematic literature review that we carried out pointed to various organizational and financial aspects that affect care transitions. And we identified eight organizational and three financial aspects that could potentially affect care transitions in long-term care systems. And among organizational aspects, there were categories such as coordination of resources, education and involvement of the patient, but also training and education of staff. When it comes to financial aspects, we identified three types, three types of financial incentives that could potentially affect care transitions. And they were namely reimbursement mechanism, reward, and penalty. And the majority of the studies focused on the role of rewards, and particularly pay for performance and the impact on care coordination. Furthermore, we also found that the highest interest in financial incentives is in primary care settings. Studies on financial incentives, meaning reimbursement, the penalties and the rewards, show inconsistent results. Therefore, we are unable to clearly state if those financial incentives will have positive or negative impact on care transitions. And Europe relies heavily on informal caregivers, and majority of long-term care for older adults in Europe is provided by informal caregivers and unsupported and unprepared informal caregivers are more likely to put older adults at higher risk of suboptimal care transitions. Therefore, in this study, we tried to analyze the available policies for supporting informal caregivers in the European Union, and we grouped them into three broad categories. The first category was the compensation and recognition, second was the labor market, and the improving carers and physical mental and well-being. And we found that particularly cash benefits are common method of supporting informal caregivers in the European Union. And moreover, we observed huge disparities between the countries in terms of support provided to informal caregivers. The results from our qualitative study indicate that country informants point out to the important role of communication transfer of information, and availability and coordination of resources and their impact on care transition. And participants reported that they experienced challenges with regard to those aspects in their countries. So for example, at present, the communication and transfer of information, not only between the providers, but between the providers and patients and informal caregivers is malfunctioning in all three countries. Moreover, the transferred information is often incomplete, delayed, or even missing, and that has serious implications on the way care is provided in another setting. Uh, for instance, the care providers in Germany still use outdated methods to transfer the patient information. And in Poland, the patient is responsible for carrying out the information and delivering it to primary care physician. The problem with the availability and coordination of resources was also acknowledged by participants in all three countries. However, it was the most pronounced in Poland when participants uh, expressed their frustration regarding the inadequate long-term care infrastructure in terms of beds and staff, and associated with it long waiting times to access formal long-term care services. And as reported, some patients have to wait even up to one year to access formal long-term care settings in Poland. And usually, over that time, their health irreversibly de deteriorates. And when it comes to financial challenges, participants from all three countries argued that particularly reimbursement mechanism might affect care transitions of um, older adults in long-term care systems. And according to their opinion, out-of-pocket payment might affect the direction of the transition 
by restricting the access to formal long-term care. And additionally, the level of reimbursement might have an impact on availability of resources in terms of beds and staff. And they were, there were some mixed opinions about the role of rewards and penalties. Nevertheless, informants from all three countries argued that financial penalties could be issued for inappropriate care, adverse events, and different types of abuse. What we also noticed that uh, the um, opinions regarding the rewards were also mixed. However, the Dutch and Polish participants um, regarded rewards as something that is not, um, not needed at this moment. And also what was very imp interesting about the penalties and the role of penalties, that the Dutch and Polish informants argued that financial penalties could even further burden already strained long-term care budgets. And when it comes to rewards, such system is already present in the Dutch long-term care system. However, the informants questioned the effectiveness of rewards in long term. And by applying the methodological triangulation and utilizing the results from our previous studies, we have been able to develop an assessment tool. And on this slide, you can see a part of this assessment tool. And the assessment tool includes sections such as category, indicator, explanation of the indicator, and the scoring system. And it is first ever tool for assessing the performance of long-term care systems in relation to care transitions. And the tool consists of two teams, namely organizational and financial aspects, 12 categories and 63 items. And with this tool, we are able to answer the following question. How, how well is long-term care system performing when it comes to organizational aspects of care transitions? And also, how well is long-term care system performing when it comes to the financial aspects uh, of care transitions? And to conclude, currently, care transitions of older adults in Germany, the Netherlands, and Poland are not optimal. And a lot has to be done in order to optimize care transitions of older adults. Also, countries face similar organizational challenges, for example, transfer of information, communication, and availability of and coordination of resources. Even though their long-term care systems differ and they represent different typologies. And countries also face similar challenges when it comes to financial aspects. And specifically, reimbursement mechanisms play an important role in care transitions in Germany, the Netherlands, and Poland. Thank you so much for your attention. I would like to say thanks also to Maastricht University and to Jagiellonia University for having the opportunity to do this joint PhD degree and Transsenior Consortium, which I was part of. <laughs> Thank you. I give a uh, word back to the prorector. Thank you for your presentation. We will now start to discuss your research for your thesis and your conclusions. The opposition will be opened by Professor Zwakhalen, Professor of Nursing Sciences, Maastricht University. Professor Zwakhalen was also chair of the assessment committee. Professor Zwakhalen. Thank you, uh, Pro Rector. Um, dear candidates, um, many thanks for your overview and also your very nice uh, uh, dissertation. And congratulations, of course, to you and your team uh, with this uh, with this wonderful um, thesis. And I think it's a it's a nice balance between all kinds of aspects that are important and play a role in formal caregiving, financial aspects, and all these other things. So it's well uh, nice combined. And I think one of your statements or one of your propositions was doing a PhD is much more is uh, much more than conducting research. It's also about becoming more resilient, flexible, and open-minded. And I think when you do a double degree, which you are doing, it must mean that you are double flexible, double open-minded, and double resilient. So, uh, um, um, yeah. With saying that, I'm also here, of course, to discuss a few things. Um, and I would like to start with uh, chapter three. I have a question specifically related to that, in which you present the review findings 
And um, if I understood well, one of your conclusions of that chapter is that financial incentives are potentially powerful. Really short, but I think that's one of the conclusions. And uh, perhaps you can help me a bit and tell me where this conclusion is based on. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for the questions and for the compliments. So uh, we know from the economic theories, uh, such as institutional uh, theory and principal agent, um, principal agent uh, uh, theory, that uh, financial incentives have a possibility to affect the behavior of the healthcare providers. Um, and based on those theories, uh, there are also a lot of studies that try to see how different types of reimbursement, reimbursement mechanisms or payment methods affect the behavior of the care providers. And what we found also in our research is that activity-based payment methods might um, lead to care providers focusing more on the volume uh, of care instead of the care coordination. And what is very important for care transitions is this care coordination that we want to um, reach between all different settings and providers. So for example, different payment methods might affect the behavior of the care provider and they might stimulate either that if this uh, provider is willing to provide coordinated care or is only willing to focus on care in their specific setting and focusing on their specific setting. And um, one of the examples is the fee-for-service um, payment method mm -hmm. that you might use, and it increases the volume, but not necessarily incentivize the care coordination among the providers. Okay. If I may interrupt you, and that's also what I, um, of course, read in your review uh, more explicitly, I was just wondering how, if you look at your review in chapter three, how valid are these conclusions? And I'm just mentioning it, especially given the fact that you also assess the methodological quality of these studies. And you've concluded that only two out of 19, I think, are of high quality. Uh, so how did you take into an, to account these methodological, yeah, a lack of quality in relation to your conclusions? Yes, this is also why we interpret our conclusions with caution and we don't say and we don't state that certain if financial incentives will have positive or negative impact mm -hmm. on the care transition because of the quality of the studies included and also heterogeneity of uh, the outcomes they were measuring, the financial incentives that they were uh, looking at. So I believe that, yeah, it is very difficult to state with this paper, but this paper also aimed to um, systemize the knowledge and see what kind of different financial incentives are there and what kind of outcomes and results they present in their mm -hmm. studies. Okay. Just let us um, well, continue uh, briefly with, uh, with another chapter, because this was also, of course, input for your item pool or your item bank, which you use in chapter six when you uh, developed the performance measure. And um, what uh, took my attention was that in chapter six, when you aim to develop this performance measure, you use the model, which is very well known in health services research and also in nursing, uh, which you use is the Donabedian model mm -hmm. right, with the structure, yes. process and outcomes. Can you uh, elaborate on why you've chosen this model and if you consider other models? Because there is some criticism on this model and perhaps you can elaborate a bit on that. Uh, actually, I think from the beginning we were considering this Donabidian model because we saw that also other assessments tool they were uh, building on this model. And um, there are three different types of measurements, indicators that can be used, the process, outcome and the structure. And uh, we, to straight strengthen our assessment tool, we actually made use of uh, two of those indicators, not only mm -hmm. relying on one. And what we saw in other studies that a lot of assessment tools that were previously created, first of all, they were focusing only on one specific transition, for example, from hospital to home, and they only used one type of indicator, mm -hmm. such as outcome. Mm -hmm. So. But Even one of the one of the criticism is that yeah. this is model is very linear. It's not yes. justified or not a real representation of the, 
Yeah, of the situation, because it focuses not on patient characteristics, not on environmental aspects, which may be important also in relation to your study. Yes, yes. We try to incorporate some um, uh, specific and important aspects to the patients in our assessment tool, because, for example, we were looking also at the involvement of the patient, of the um, assessment of the patient's needs and experiences or um, different and they are included as items in our tool. So we try to maybe broaden it a bit because, of course, the, uh, the patient is the most important in the entire care transition and also the informal caregiver. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm um, look at the prorector if there is time left. A for brief, a brief question. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, telling while well, mentioning this, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you use it a bit broader and just use all these other aspects that... But might you, given the fact that you uh, collected these items and built this item bank based on this review, which is yeah, which is solid, well done, but well, not giving very uh, strong uh, uh, studies inside, and this done in your model, do you think that may have influenced the yeah the the validity of your own uh, performance measure? Uh, thank you. Actually, also uh, the development and the item pool was built not only based uh, on the systematic literature review, mm -hmm. but we also carried out in-depth semi-structured interviews with key country informants. And there were uh, 23 participants included in those uh, studies and they were from three different countries. So they also show different perspective. And after we created this pool, we validate, uh, like we tried to validate it with the five different experts also from different countries. Um, and they were checking for the relevance of the items and also checking the clarity. So the first validation, I think it was also um, made with the five different um, experts that we included and they were not part of our study, so they didn't uh, know what we were working on and they provided us with scores and we developed the form to be filled by them. Thank you for comforting me and uh, I give the word back to the project. Thank you, <clears throat> Professor Zwakhaven. The opposition will be continued by Professor Kowalska Bobko, Director of the Institute of Public Health, Faculty of Health Sciences, Jagiellonian University in Krakow. I'm here, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Pro Rector. I would like to congratulate the presentation, very good, as well as the dissertation. I think the problem of the long-term care research is one of the most relevant and the most important in the contemporary healthcare systems in the European Union. And this dissertation presents it correctly and clearly, both in the terms of purpose and the methodology and analysis carried out. And important, I think very important contribution of the authors is the development of the transitional care assessment tool in long-term care, and uh, uh, the candidate presented it very uh, nicely during the presentation. So I would like to ask you about the Polish healthcare system, because uh, you know there are so many deficits on the level of the long-term care in Poland, and one of the most important, I think, is the lack of the connection um, between the a social care system and the healthcare system. And I wonder uh, how you can use your research to bring the social and the healthcare uh, closer uh, together, especially in the Polish healthcare system. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your question and for the compliments. Uh, so, if I understood your co question right, the division, uh, the horizontal division between the health and social care systems is uh, very visible in Poland, but also it is present yeah, in exactly. other long, uh, in other systems uh, in Germany, for example. And of course, and we know also from studies and uh, from our own project, that this division uh, has an implications on care transitions. And uh, because even the transition within one system is problematic, at this moment in time, 
and transition between two different uh, systems that are not connected and they are not collaborating and not working together pose even more uh, bigger threat uh, for the patient's safety. And uh, I think what we found in our project that it is very important to try to um, integrate those two systems because it will ease not only the communication between the providers and the settings, but it will also ease the transfer of information and um, it will also give some um, boundaries of responsibilities that each system should have for the patient. And of course, it will be easier to navigate for the patient if they are redirected from one system to another and the providers mm -hmm. also in other systems, they know what the other system is doing, what they are focusing on, how it can be um, accessed by the patient. And this is also what we found something important in our studies, that majority of providers actually don't have, um, don't have too much information about what is happening in other settings, even within one system. And even more, it is a problem because they don't know what is happening in other settings, in, for example, social uh, care systems. So I think also improving the knowledge of providers, what can be um, expected from another system, how the patient can access this system, but trying to integrate those two systems so they can work together better, coordinate the care together, and um, they could easier communicate, transfer information. I think this is very important. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. What do you think? Did you find any good practices that we can use in Poland to build this integration between the social and the health uh, uh, policy? So there are some systems in Europe that, uh, that integrate those uh, health and uh, social care systems better. And one of the examples is actually Denmark. But also, uh, we can look at the example of Ireland and Portugal and how they re uh, integrate those systems to work better efficiently and co like cooperate um, for the patient. So I think we can okay. look at... So the, this I understand. So you, uh, uh, yes, I agree. The Danish healthcare system, I think, I think it's a very good example. Uh, how to use uh, this possibility to bring together those uh, policies. And another question, if I have time, I would like to ask you about the human resources and the circumstances, the possibilities to build the, uh, the skill mixed therapeutic team, because as you know, there are so many deficits of the uh, nurses, physicians on the long-term care. Uh, so, uh, what do you think about this subject? So what we you wrote it a lot. Yeah. Yes. So in general, the interprofessional collaboration between different uh, providers and uh, professionals is very important. And what we also found in our studies, and this was really pronounced in Poland and in Germany, that care assistants could be um, the training for care assistants could be good solution to try to resolve to certain extent the shortage of um, social care workers or long-term care workers in Europe. And uh, particularly the Germany and uh, Polish experts argued that social care, uh, the care assistants might uh, provide care, not necessarily medical, but around medical care for the patients. Yes. And therefore it might be, um, yeah, it might be beneficial because we don't have sufficient number of nurses, so we might use other individuals that, for example, their training takes a bit shorter. And um, probably it would be good to have care assistants to address the patients that don't have really medical needs, but more um, needs related to activities of daily living. And, uh, Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kowalska, Bobko. The opposition will be continued by Professor Agnitska Soa Kofta. Thank you very much, um, Pro Rector. Um, dear candidate, first of all, I, I would like to congratulate you on um, today's presentation. Uh, very clear and informative, and a very interesting thesis. 
I think it's worth um, underlying that the uh, issue of care transition is of particular importance, um, and it's rarely looked uh, upon in uh, research. Um, I would like to um, ask you to uh, have a, a little bit of broader look at um, different long-term care um, systems, because you analyzed in chapter um, two and the third chapter some of the features, uh, particularly of organizational and financial character. You look at different incentives created by different financial mechanisms. But um, it's very um, important on how the system performs in terms of transition. Uh, it strongly depends on the whole design of the system, whether it's um, unified, more unified, like it is in Germany. You have long-term care systems separated from the health system and from the social assistance with different responsibility of each of them. Um, in Poland, you have um, two tiers, typical two-tier system. Um, but also a very low supply of uh, care. In the Netherlands, you have some um, much higher supply of care, but also high level of privatization of care. So I would like to ask you how um, the level of um, supply of care, all these organizational features, how um, they um, are, are reflected in the tool uh, the assessment tool that um, you have uh, prepared and tested. Okay, highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your uh, question. Um, it is a difficult one because this assessment tool was built to assess the performance of um, long-term care systems in relation to care transitions in general for the uh, long-term care systems, not for a specific long-term care system. So. Of course, there are certain items that um, they might be not relevant, for example, to certain um, long-term care system, and uh, others that might be understood differently by different people feeling in different countries. And what we try to do is actually include three countries uh, in the um, development of the assessment tool by in including three countries in the semi-structured in-depth interviews with key country informants, that represent different typologies. So, as we already said, the uh, Polish system is characterized by low supply and low expenditures uh, on long-term care. German system is characterized by medium to high uh, supply and um, um, me medium also expenditures on, um, on uh, long-term care. And uh, the Netherlands is characterized by high supply and high uh, expenditures of long-term care. And by uh, using those the, um, results from qualitative study with key experts from all these three countries, we try to tackle and to see characteristics of each system and then develop a tool that will be uh, understandable and uh, applicable to more than one typo typology of the system. Um, and yeah, we, we just try to include different typologies of long-term care systems uh, in the study. So we try to show and represent more diversity of long-term care systems in Europe. Did you manage to find uh, some peculiarities given the diversity of the, of the long-term care system while testing? Did you manage to find some peculiarities and differences within uh, performance of these systems? S uh, not really with the uh, performance, but I was also focusing on the provision of care in general and looking the division of the formal and informal care and how relevant it is in a certain country. And for example, uh, before also the reform in 2015 in the Netherlands, the focus was very strong on institutional care. And um, in Poland, on the other hand, the focus is strongly on uh, informal care provided by informal caregivers and the institutional settings and the formal long-term care is underdeveloped. So uh, this was something uh, very um, interesting to see because those systems, they are tot organized totally differently, not only in terms of financing, but also of the provision and on the focus they put on formal and informal care. Um, so this was one of the um, main differences, and I think this is the striking differences and important differences, because also uh, if the government relies strongly on informal care, 
they might be not willing to um, develop or tackle the problems within the formal long-term care. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Achnitska Sova Kofta. The opposition will be continued by Professor Wikowska, uh, Professor of Health Economics at the School of Economics in Warsaw. Professor Wikowska. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. And uh, dear candidate, I would like uh, I would like also to congratulate about the the thesis, the topic you have chosen, but the most about the assessment tool. Why? Because maybe from my practical background, I worked for several years for the health ministry in the Department for Strategy and Analysis. And if you want to implement some changes, reforms in the systems, the first question is how it is in other countries, how the system looks like and works in other countries. Like to let's take something from other countries and implement in ours. And then start to, uh, there is a discussion if something is good or bad and how to compare. And I think this, uh, I would like to use this assessment tool uh, after your defense uh, in a practice uh, to compare the countries, not only to compare the countries, but to explain why we can choose something to work better in our. So my questions are um, maybe a little bit too uh, practical ones, but I would like um, to ask you about um, um, all those uh, organizational and financial challenges um, regarding uh, care transition in long-term care you discussed in your thesis, but I would like you to point the one, the most important challenge um, to, uh, to face uh, in, development, uh, in development of effective uh, care transition. And thank you so much for your question and for the compliments also on my uh, work. Um, it is also a very difficult question because, as I also mentioned in my propositions, the organizational and financial aspects are very interrelated. So um, if the financial aspects are not addressed, then we will have problem within the organizational. And an example is the level of reimbursement. If the reimbursement is uh, very low, maybe there is a low number of beds and facilities, and this will have impact on the coordination of resources and, um, in general, the provision of care. But if I had to choose something and to start from something, I probably would choose coordination and availability of resources. Because even if we improve the transfer of information, and even if we improve the communication, if there are no places where the patients can be discharged from the hospital, then the transition will be of poor quality and it will be suboptimal. Because there are many examples, uh, and this was also shown in the uh, study in Poland, that some patients have to wait even up to a year to be placed in formal long-term care uh, facility. And usually their health is, um, yeah, their health irreversibly deteriorates at that time. And even though the communication and the transfer of information between the providers would be very good, then they are not transitioned at the right time to the right place. Um, but also just focusing, so I would choose maybe one from organizational, and if uh, if I may, I would choose also from the financial aspects, because. I think they go hand in hand. So, um, yeah, as I, as I mentioned also, if we want to move from, traditional, from how traditionally health services are provided, and they are focused now on acute care, on a provision of care in one setting by one provider, and responsibility is usually within one setting, and if we want to move towards integrated care models, we need to change the entire way how we prov the provision aspects, but also financial and how we finance. So integrated care models could promote the uh, care that is um, provided to the patients, but also to the communities they are living in with informal caregivers. And of course, uh, it could um, enhance the 
shared, shared responsibility be between the providers. So, for example, I believe that payment mechanism, different payment mechanism, might integrate and might encourage this integration of care models. So, it is. I hope uh, this answers your question. It is very difficult to answer just one aspect because they are so interrelated. And um, yeah, if I only focus on one, then probably it c it would not be able to it it wouldn't work anyway because there is some problem and challenge with regard to another aspect. So. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. I completely agree about these interrelations, but if you want to make a small change and you are able, you, this is some kind, uh, sometimes a window of opportunity to choose only one and to implement, it is very good to know where to start. Uh, and uh, I completely agree with these integrated uh, care models, but um, and about financing, because my second question is about the financing mechanism, because you can finance in a different way. As, uh, the solutions you pointed that there are some uh, some financial incentives that can promote or hamper the car transition. Could you give uh, the, some examples about those incentives? And uh, the, coming from uh, taking from this uh, your uh, answer, uh, how you would uh, finance uh, or put in, uh, financial incentives to this integrated care model as you would build one? So. Uh, we identified three different types of financial incentives. So first, reimbursement mechanism. And in our studies, we also found that activity-based payment methods might um, encourage more the volume and not care coordination, not uh, incentivize the care coordination among providers. On the other hand, value-based payment methods hold the promise. However, there were also questions um, among the participants because the participants from all three countries um, questioned how to measure the quality of uh, care transitions. It is very difficult also, because also the, um, the long-term care and the measuring quality in long-term can be, can be problematic. Uh, and then we have the use of penalties. And um, in economic theory, we know that the penalty of the same size as reward would work more than the reward. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what we saw in our studies, that even though penalties had a really good focus, they didn't uh, sometimes um, bring the results that they were intended for. So, for example, there, were so, there, were, there was some study that um, focused on uh, giving penalties to hospitals that uh, exceeded the, uh, the threshold of stay in the hospital. But then it caused uh, this problem that providers were rushing the patients because they just wanted to avoid the penalty. And they were uh, moving them to another facility, even though the patients were not prepared. So even though the, the mechanism behind the penalty had good some intentions, it leads to bad outcomes for the patients at the end. Um, then uh, the role of rewards. So I think that... Um, Particularly, it was interesting that Polish participants were interested in rewards. And uh, there was uh, less interest uh, about the financial rewards among the Dutch and German participants. Because they, they questioned also how to measure the quality of care and who will get the reward in case of uh, well-performed care transition or optimal care transition and how to measure this. But also they um, argued that rewards sh work only in short term. And this was also mentioned by uh, experts uh, in the Netherlands, where they already have the rewards in long-term care system, but uh, they observe that usually they work for a short uh, while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would only comment that probably this is because of the system. If you, uh, in Polish healthcare system, the rewards the, are not used uh, very often, and that's why maybe there is much more interest than in other systems that are much more mature. I, I think this is uh, this is maybe the, the explanation for that. But still, uh, uh, we all, all, as you can all see, that the problem is much more difficult than it seems to be. And eh? thank you very much for your answers. Thank you, Professor Wikowska. The opposition will be continued by Professor Scholz, Professor of Community Geriatrics <clears throat> at Maastricht University. Professor Scholz.
Thank you, Pro Rector, dear uh, candidate. My compliments for your scientific work and, of course, also my compliments for your supervisors in front of me. Your thesis is about a very relevant and interesting topic, care transitions. My first question, I hope I can uh, address three questions, but we'll see this still some time. But my first question relates to your general introduction, and you only need to answer with yes or no. I don't want to hear more. Eh? First question. In the general introduction, you state, within the definition of transitional care, two concepts are often mentioned in literature, care coordination and care continuity. I like these terms, but in literature, often the four C's of appropriate integrated care are mentioned. And next to coordination and continuity, I read a lot about communication and complementarity of care. Are these not equally important as care continuity and care coordination? Yes or no? Highly esteemed opponent. Uh, this is one of the most difficult questions because... Yes or no? <laughs> I think yes. Thank you very much, because when I read your thesis, you mention co communication very often, eh? Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. That was the first question. <laughs> then I go to my second question, which is a little bit longer. In chapter two, you describe preliminary review findings to provide a base for further full systematic reviews and to outline a model. I was surprised about the terms preliminary and about the term full a review. Do I understand it right now that this means that you didn't do a full review? How must I assess your review then? Was it a partial review or was it a quick and therefore incomplete review? And what does this mean for the model you have outlined? Is it also preliminary? The more because I miss, for instance, aspects like accessibility of care services and shared decision making in addition to education, and also affordability of care services as financial aspect. Or do I see it wrongly? Hi, esteemed opponent. Thank you so much for your question. So, first of all, the ch chapter uh, two uh, involves the preliminary uh, review findings, because when we conducted this review, we didn't um, expect also this high number of publications that would um, describe organizational fa aspects affecting care transitions and care coordination. And we had to broad our search term also to uh, mention the integration of integrated care, care coordination and care continuity, because the term transitional care and care transitions is not still widely used. And even though it can mean similar thing. And uh, this uh, review, preliminary review, points out to different uh, aspects that were mentioned in the publications, and it gives also information for future researchers that there is high number of literature on certain aspects, because we mentioned also the number of publications for each organizational and financial aspects, and we develop a ground for future studies also. So, um, and to, what we found is also very relevant because um, we noticed that the highest interest uh, or the highest number of studies was on transfer of information, communication and coordination of resources. And this was also reflected in our uh, in-depth semi-structured interviews where yeah. the participants said that these aspects are very important. Um, and there was some second part of the question um, uh, about uh, the if we if yeah. we in, if we the model so this is preliminary also model but we mentioned this uh, in this discussion that it it should be validated with future studies and we mm. tried to validate this model with uh, in-depth semi-structured interviews and therefore we change uh, one of the categories or two of the categories and about the shared decision making if it's involved in the model it is included the section on education and involvement of the patients and informal caregivers um, re re um, like in involves not only the education, but involvement in decision-making process, um, in, um, yeah, in the, uh, assessing, for, the, for example, for the preferences and needs mm. of the patients. So this involvement is broad term. So what you show now is you did a very good job 
But if I look to the title, it, it, it can indicate a negative image, eh? preliminary. Yes. So I was surprised that you didn't get any remarks from reviewers of the journal you published it in, because I think what you actually did was a scoping review, because you included much more literature and, and not a systematic review. Or, and that's good work. Yes. So maybe suggestion for the future, you can't change the title anymore. Eh? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And I think we will try to validate this model okay. and uh, to validate it with other studies and to see if it's really applicable, if it still uh, can be, or we, do, we need to add some more aspects to that model. Uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe we can discuss this in the future when I visit you in Poland. <laughs> uh, I have one uh, last question, uh, if it's yes. allowed. Yeah. I was um, very pleased to see that next to organizational and financial issues, you also um, paid a lot of attention to informal care, because I think it's very important in long-term care. And in chapter four, it was all about strategies supporting informal caregivers. Eh? And after reading this chapter, and, and after you have finished all your studies until now, um, my question is, what can countries with a strong formal healthcare system that is now in danger of collapse because of uh, the costs, learn from countries with a strong informal healthcare system if they want to strengthen their informal care and vice versa. This is very also a difficult question because the countries with strong uh, formal care, uh, I mean, I think uh, what we also observe in countries that have very strong formal uh, long-term care, that um, countries such as Sweden, Netherlands, they are moving towards the, the institutionalization, so moving towards the care provided either by informal caregivers or by uh, formal uh, long-term care workers at home. So this is in order um, to, um, for the cost containment. Uh, and what is very important is that uh, if we focus merely on institutional uh, care, then uh, we, will, uh, we will face really high expenditures yeah. in the future. But what can we learn, for instance, from a country like uh, Portugal or Spain, with, with, with very high informal care? Uh, what, what, yeah. we, what we see is actually that their expenditure on long-term care is lower. Yeah. So what we can see that informal care in some certain cases, not always, is cheaper than institutional care. Yeah. Because also there are some studies that demonstrate that, inform that formal care, uh, informal care, uh, if the patient is very severely ill or um, if the patient has high dependency, it, it doesn't necessarily reduce the cost. Yeah. But what should so, our government do to stimulate informal care more than now? Yeah, I think uh, the best is to support informal caregivers. And uh, there are many different ways. Uh, cash benefits, as we mentioned, they are the most common method to recognize the informal caregivers. However, I would also, uh, um, like I would also uh, suggest that it is very important to make sure that um, uh, informal caregivers have access to social care benefits so they secure their future because um, if they only receive the cash benefit, but if the, um, the patient dies, then they are left without work, uh, without employment, without income, and um, probably they are also at the age where it's very difficult to yeah. enter the labor market. Yeah, so to connect social services yes. even more. And just maybe what we could learn, like what countries that focus so strongly on informal care in Central and Eastern Europe uh, particularly, what we could learn and uh, what we could also um, suggest that it is very important also to develop, to, to develop formal uh, long-term care infrastructure in those countries. So uh, we are going a bit different direction when it comes okay. to, yeah, but I think it is very important because... I'm satisfied. Thank you very much. I give the word back to the program. Thank you, Professor Scholz. The opposition will be continued by Professor Groot, Professor of Health Economics, Maastricht University. Professor thank, Groot. Thank you, Mr. Pro-Rector, uh, dear candidate. Let me start by saying that I wholeheartedly endorse uh, the uh, words of appreciation that have been uh, spoken by uh, the previous uh, opponents. In view of the time, as the time for your defense is quickly running out, I will leave it uh, at that and, and uh, come um, 
uh, to the questions that I have and the points that I want to discuss uh, with you. Um, first, uh, I want to discuss with you uh, the last of your statements in the uh, list of propositions. Uh, I must say I was a bit surprised to find uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, that you uh, used a quote from Dostoevsky uh, in your, as your, one of your propositions. Um, as um, the topic of your uh, dissertation uh, um, is uh, uh, people who make use of long-term care, uh, which are frequently or, or almost always uh, people with uh, uh, grave impairments, either physically or, or mentally, uh, typically um, uh, uh, a resident of a, of a nursing home is someone with uh, uh, some form of dementia, uh, Alzheimer or other forms of dementia, who, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, to borrow the words from uh, Dostoevsky in, in the quote that you have uh, um, uh, 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 used, uh, is without a concrete idea of what he or she is living uh, uh, for. So I was wondering um, yeah, uh, how this quote that you have uh, used as a proposition uh, relates to um, uh, long-term care residents. Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your question. Um, yeah, I think it is very important for a human being in general to have some purpose in life and also some meaningful to life added. And how it relates to uh, patients with the, um, in the long-term care um, facilities, for example, or people that um, have long-term care needs, is that I think it is very difficult also for some, uh, for some uh, patients um, to live with conditions that are chronic for a really long time, causing a lot of pain and um, suffering for oh. them. Um, and um, now I'm not a great fan of Dostoevsky, I must say. <laughs> I think he's someone who had not really a very high moral compass, um, that was at least questionable. But would you, would you agree with, that, uh, with uh, uh, this uh, uh, statement uh, from Dostoevsky? I think I would agree for myself, but mm -hmm. not necessarily okay. for everyone, because for me it has a meaning of, um, also has meaning uh, related to my uh, work. Because um, I, I was doing this project also uh, looking at uh, a lot of patients and a lot of uh, people in my surroundings and the community that uh, suffered from a lot of diseases and were in need of long-term care and uh, didn't receive care either on time or didn't uh, receive um, proper care. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the meaning for me is that uh, actually doing this work was way easier for me and uh, giving me pleasure because uh, this is something that I really care about and th that has deep meaning for me. So, yeah. um, well, I beg to differ. And I think it is, uh, think, it is easier. Uh, I think it, uh, yeah, what, uh, the, if, you, if you read them uh, uh, accurately uh, or closely, then it can have very adverse, perverse consequences for people who are um, uh, yeah, who have, for example, dementia. So, okay. There's, uh, in the few minutes that we have left, uh, I want to discuss another uh, issue in your dissertation. Um, the focus of your dissertation is on care transitions, and what struck me uh, is that you describe care transitions mostly in negative terms. Uh, for example, in, in uh, chapter two, uh, you write that care transitions come with a risk of negative health and quality con consequences and should be avoided uh, or optimized when possible. Um, and that, th I wondered why you uh, uh, describe uh, these care transitions in such uh, negative terms. Uh, uh, um, are there also positive uh, uh, aspects to, to care uh, transitions? For example, that patients are moved to um, conditions, to, to facilities where they receive better care. Uh, uh, actually, and, and uh, a better care for. Um, that, that's one thing, uh, what I wanted to ask you. And the second thing is, yeah, the focus on care transitions, um, of course, takes uh, away the, the, the focus on, um, yeah, the, 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 the stay in care, eh? the, uh, the, 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 the opposite, opposite side of the coin of transition is to stay. Uh, and for example, here in the Netherlands, we have a very huge problem with what we call the wrong bed problem. Uh, patients who uh, um, uh, stay in hospital 
uh, but ha are um, uh, do do no longer need hospital care, but uh, are unable, uh, because of their impairments, to return home, uh, uh, but for whom there is also not a, uh, a place in a nursing uh, uh, home. Um, so, aren't there? Uh, so, so the underlying suggestion that you make in your dissertation is is also that. Um, yeah, the absence of a transition, uh, so a stay somewhere, uh, has positive effects. And, and I wonder whether that's always uh, uh, the case. So uh, perhaps you can reflect a bit uh, why, uh, the, the, on the positive sides on care transitions and the negative sides of the absence of uh, 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 care transitions. So I would like to say first that uh, mm, care transitions don't always need to be negative. Um, and they, there, there are a lot of transitions that are needed, and they should happen for the patients that, for example, they are not provided with the right care at home, moving, for example, to institutional settings or um, being provided with formal uh, long-term care might be beneficial. Uh, however, when we look also at older adults, uh, they are high-risk group for suboptimal care transitions. So if the transition is not necessary, we should always try to avoid it. An example of this transition is uh, transition from home to hospital. Or um, if, the, if the problems can be resolved within the primary care, there is no need for the patient to go to the hospital and face all the risk of being hospitalized also. And um, what I also uh, noticed that there are a lot of transitions that are very important and need to take place. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the mileage,
Southside, ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and die. I'm mm -hmm. going to the south side. Mm -hmm. Ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. Mm -hmm. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. Mm -hmm. No place like home. Mm -hmm. If it's questions that you've got.
Esther Vizorek. The Greek committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Evers is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Professor Evers. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent and independent and responsible? I promise. Great. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Estera Vichurik, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by the custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and all members of the commission and affiliated with the official seal of the university. Professor Sawada, you can now give the laudatio. Dear Estera, dear Dr. Estera Vichorek, you have done it. Uh, the PhD project has come to the end and it is my great honor to deliver this laudatio in recognition of your remarkable journey on behalf of your supervisory team, Professor Silvia Evers, Professor Milena Pavlova, Dr. Eva Kotzot, and myself. Today we gather to celebrate an academic achievement, but also your remarkable resilience and unwavering determination. You are now officially the holder of PhD uh, from the uh, Ma Maastricht University. And in two hours, I'm sure you will be also the holder of the PhD from the oldest Polish universities, the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. We congratulate you. I met Esther Ayu in 2019. In October 2019, you started your way as a PhD student at the Doctoral School of Medicine and Health Sciences at the Jagiellonian University and the Research School Capri here in Maastricht. However, your journey with the PhD project started some, man er some months earlier. In January 2019, you were officially selected as the final candidate for the project financing long-term care systems, particularly for optimized care transition. This project was part of the 13 projects within Transsenio, uh, our shared EU-funded international training network. Candidates from all over the world could apply for this project, and you, Estera, won it. You received great scores from all reviewers and all people involved in the requirement process agreed that you would make the excellent candidate for the project. And we didn't make a mistake. You were an excellent candidate for the project and also an excellent student at our doctoral schools. Actually, it couldn't be otherwise, considering your previous achievements. You hold a Bachelor of European Public Health, a Master 
of Global Health and a Master of Healthcare Policy, Innovation and Management from Maastricht. During your studies, you completed internships at the European Commission Directory General for Health and Food Science Safety, Trimbos Institute in the Netherlands. Moreover, you completed an exchange at the University of Sheffield and Tamasad University in Bangkok, in Thailand. Prior to starting uh, your PhD, you spent three months in Vietnam as a volunteer program manager where you were engaged in activities relate, related to public health. You lived in six countries on two continents where you gained not only the knowledge of specific six of various health systems, but also the feeling for other cultures and the passion for work in international and intercultural teams. But this passion is not limited only to your scientific work. It is something more. It is your general attitude towards other people from other countries, from other cultures, people who may need help. Only two examples for it. During your PhD in 2021, after the Russian aggression in Ukraine, you became a volunteer at the main stage train station in Krakow and two reception centers for refugees in Krakow, where you spent almost every evening for half a year while working on your PhD. Your contribution and dedication in helping refugees arriving from the Ukraine was acknowledged by the Polish Scouting Association. The second example from the last few days. You were the one who took care of a student from Maastricht who fell ill during a study visit to Krakow and was admitted to hospital. You accompanied her, helped her, brought water, etc. All thought it was not your responsibility. The guardians from Maastricht should take care of her. Therefore, you are not only an excellent scientist and a very good teacher. I would like to mention here that you contributed to the teaching activities at the Jagiellonian University Medical College by giving lectures and training to bachelor and master students. But you are also a very good person, open to the needs of other people, not avoiding work, engaging in the life of the university, and the doctoral school. Dear Esther, congratulations on your outstanding achievement. Thank you for this PhD journey that we walk together and let's keep building wonderful things. I sincerely hope that in a few weeks you will join my team at the Department of Health Economics and Social Security at the Jagiellonian University in your new role as an academic teacher and senior researcher. Coming to the end, I extend my congratulations to your relatives, to your parents, friends. Your parents are here today. Let me address them in Polish. Szanowni rodzice, Esther. Serdecznie gratuluję wam, córki. Możecie być dumni nie tylko z tego, że Estera dziś otrzyma podwójny stopień doktora najlepszego polskiego i najlepszego holenderskiego uniwersytetu. Przede wszystkim możecie być dumni z tego, że Estera jest wspaniałym, otwartym na potrzeby innych, dobrym człowiekiem. To też wasza zasługa. Gratuluję. Congratulations. Thank you. Dear Dr. Vizorek, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. Also, congratulations to your supervisory team. With this thesis, you have 
created a very interesting research which is important for our university as a beautiful example of um, a joint doctoral degree. So where the cooperation between our two universities is clearly reflected. In addition to your international comparison you have made in your thesis. Congratulations. And hereby I close this academic ceremony. Let's now make a picture. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes. Oh, yeah. Recording stopped. Don't forget it. That's the plastic thing.